we're not going to be in Luke today. Last week we were in Luke chapter 18 and Jesus gave a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector, the Pharisee being the most honorable, respected, religious and moral person in Israel and the tax collector being the most considered the most immoral and uh, just wicked man in Israel. And they both went to the temple to pray and the, the Pharisee basically prayed, Lord, thank you that I'm such a good person. While the tax collector cried out for mercy and God said that this man, the tax collector, went home justified rather than the other. And so this word justified is extremely important. It's extremely important. And so we need to do another lesson today on justification. Because justification is at the very heart of the gospel. Um, the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, its primary issue was the doctrine of justification. They had a number of things that they disagreed with the Roman Catholic Church with, but the number one issue that they disagreed and could not compromise on was the doctrine of justification. And most people don't understand these terms, don't, uh, don't know much about theology, and so uh, you will hear people who say, oh, why, you, know, you have Catholics, you have Greek Orthodox, you have Protestants, why do you need to have all these different groups? Can't we all just get together? Can't we all just love Jesus? The people who say that don't really know the theology of either side. And uh, I don't want us to be ignorant of what the scripture teaches. I don't want us to be ignorant of what each church teaches. And so my goal for today is I want to explain to you, I want you to all understand clearly what justification is according to the historic Protestant position, position that we hold. I want you to know what justification is concern, as far as the Roman Catholics and the Greek Orthodox is concerned. I want you to know the differences. And I want you to know why it matters that we are not joined together with them. So, first of all, what is justification? Let me write it out. I'm going to be using my board a lot today. All right? Justification. What does it mean? Well, right from the beginning, you see that there is some uh, relation to the word justice. So, there is some kind of legal aspect to this term justification. And that makes a lot of sense because, as we know, in the Bible, God is oftentimes spoken of as a judge. Uh, Abraham said that God was the judge of all the earth. We read in the Bible that we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So what does it mean to justify? Jesus in the parable said, this man went home justified. What does it mean to justify? Now I'm going to explain to you the uh, Protestant position, what justify means, what justification means, and then we'll look at the Greek Orthodox position and Roman Catholic. They're not that different. What does it mean to justify? To justify is basically the opposite of condemn. If you have a judge and you bring a person who is accused, the judge has two options. He will either justify him or he will condemn him. He will, God, the, the judge will give his verdict and he will either pronounce him to be guilty, condemn him, or he will justify him and pronounce that he is not guilty. That's what it means to justify. That's what we believe justification is. When God declares someone to be not guilty. That's what justification is. The question is, how does this work? How is it possible for a sinful man who has sinned against the Holy God to stand before him and then God to declare him to be not guilty? How can God declare a sinful man righteous? How is that possible? 
Now, you can all be turning to Romans chapter 4 while I draw something on the board. Romans chapter 4. Now, let's do a big circle here. Another circle there. Uh. Now, notice these two circles. <laughs> This circle here will represent Christ. This circle here will represent people, us. Now, I'm going to put little X's in this circle. Each X will represent a sin. <laughs> How many, let's assume this is you. How many X's should I put in here? That's five. More than five? Should I keep going? Okay. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Should I keep going? Or is that too many sins? You haven't, you haven't sinned that much, have you? You can go outside the circle too. No. I can, I can just kind of blacken it until there's nothing left. Okay? Those are just sins that we have. Okay. How many X's should I put on Christ? Zero. Nothing. Christ never sinned. Now I could, I could put uh, how much righteousness did Christ perform? Well, perfect righteousness. Everything he did was righteous. He did everything that God required. So I, I could put a bunch of little, uh, little check marks or something. But I'll just, I'll just do one big check mark right there. Perfect righteousness in Christ. And in us, tons of sins. Now, according to the Protestant belief, justification requires... A double transfer. What does that mean? That means that all these sins that you see in us are transferred to Christ. So imagine all these sins all, all on Christ. Okay? Which means that since they've been transferred to him, since they have been accounted to him, since they have been put on his account, they are taken off of ours. This is good news. But, this is not enough. Because we could say, well, Christ has taken his, our sins upon him. But, we haven't done anything good ourselves. It's one thing to say, well, Christ has paid for my sins. Christ has taken my sins. But, theoretically, that would not be enough. God cannot declare me to be righteous if I have done no righteousness. But there is another transfer that occurs. The same way that my sins have been placed upon Christ, His righteousness is given to me. And now... I can stand before God clothed in Christ's righteousness and when God as a judge sees my case he says not guilty not guilty perfect righteousness you have the righteousness of Christ this is good news this is good news how does this happen how, how, how does this transfer occur what needs to happen well, the Bible teaches, we believe, the Bible teaches that this happens by faith alone in Christ. If you are in Romans chapter 4, well actually, you could look at Romans chapter 3, just a few verses earlier than that. In Romans chapter 3, Paul actually makes this statement, look at verse 28. Romans 3.28, he says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified, declared just and righteous, by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Without the deeds of the law. But listen to what he says. Look, let's go to chapter 4. He says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, 
So if, if he was declared righteous by God because of his works, because of what he did, he has something to boast about, but not before God. If a man thinks that he can stand before God in his own righteousness, because of the, uh, the good works that he has done, he can boast before God. Look at all the good stuff that I've done. Right? Verse 3. He says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is very important. Abraham believed God. He is quoting from Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. A righteousness was put on his account, so to speak. It wasn't his own righteousness. If it was his own righteousness, he could boast. But a righteousness was given to him, accounted to him, that wasn't his. Keep on reading. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Right? Makes perfect sense. But to him who does not work, but believes, there's the faith, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes or reckons or accounts righteousness apart from works. Now you see that there is an imputation here. There is a reckoning righteousness to a man which is not his. God accounts a righteousness to a person apart from works. He didn't work for this righteousness. Verse 7. This is the quote from David from Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute or account sin. We read of two imputations or two reckonings, two accountings that occur. In one case, in verse 6, he speaks of accounting righteousness to a person and that righteousness is not his. And then in verse 8, you read of sin that, that is yours that is not accounted to you. You have sin. You don't have righteousness. Yet, righteousness is accounted to you and your sin is not. How does that happen? Because of the transfer through faith. When we trust in Christ, our sins are placed upon Him and that is why He dies. That is why He is punished for our sins. Our sins are placed upon Him, put on His account, and He is punished and dies. While we get to go free because we have been given His righteousness. And God looks at you and says, you're not guilty. This is the good news of the gospel. There's one, keep your, keep your hand here in Romans because we're going to come back to Romans, but please go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If there's a verse that you need to learn off by heart, if you want to learn one verse from the Bible, this would be a good one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the last verse, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's break that down real quick. For he, that's God the Father, made him, that's Christ, who knew no sin, to be, to become sin for us. Our sin is placed upon Him. So that, as a result, we might become the righteousness of God. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 said, I do not want to stand before God in my own righteousness, which is by the law. I want to stand before God in the righteousness that is from God, that is given to me. So, let me give you a quick summary of the Protestant position as far as 
what I want to do is I want to show you what Protestants believe. I'm going to do a nice little outline. And then I'm going to do a nice little outline for what the Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholics believe. Because I want you to see the difference of how we understand justification and salvation and how they understand justification. So, I'm going to do a line here. And let's assume this is a line of someone's life. And they're born here. Birth. Okay? And they die here. Death. Now, a person who is an elect, a person of God, um, he is born a sinner. And at some point in his life, uh, uh, I'm sorry, keep in mind, I'm not going to give you every detail of how a person is saved. We're not going to talk about election today. We're not going to talk about predestination, God calling someone, drawing him. We're not going to get into every detail. What I want to emphasize is justification, how justification works in a person's life. Now, a person is born, and at some point in time, he comes to have faith. Faith in Christ. Okay? The moment that that person has faith in Christ, God justifies him. Justification. Justification is a moment in time when a person comes to have faith in Christ, God declares him to be righteous because at this moment the transaction occurs. Our, God's righteousness is given to the man. His, righteousness, his sin is placed upon Christ. And at this, point, at this point, the man is justified before God. God has reached his verdict. You're not guilty. Alright? Now, what does that have as a result for the rest of the, of the man's life? If you go back to Romans chapter 5... After Paul has spoken in chapter 4 about how a person is justified. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 is an amazing verse that you should learn off by heart also. He says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith. So you notice justification is something that occurred in a Christian's life in the past. Having been justified by faith, we have, now, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The moment that God has declared you not guilty, you can have peace with God. You're no longer at war with God. God is not angry with you anymore because of your sin. Your sin is gone. You're His child. God has made a declaration, a legal declaration that you are not guilty. And no one is going to change that. No one is going to come and say, God, I have some extra information that you didn't have about this person. No one is going to appeal God's decision. Once God has justified a person, that person is God's forever. Because God does not change his mind. And so that means that from this moment on, you have peace with God because He has justified you. In fact, you can go to Romans chapter 8. Let's go there. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 where Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Up until this point, a person should fear condemnation because he doesn't trust in Christ and his sins are not forgiven. But from the moment that he has trusted in Christ and God has declared him righteous, you do not have to fear condemnation anymore. Condemnation is the opposite of justification. God has justified you. You're not guilty. I am not going to condemn you. And we have peace. And we can have assurance of salvation and assurance that I am not going to hell anymore. God justified me. And this justification is not based on something that I did. I didn't do it so that I could lose it. God did it for me. Christ did it for me. And since that is the basis of my justification, Christ's perfect righteousness, 
placed on my account, that's not going to change. Christ isn't going to change. God isn't going to change who justified me. So that's it. Now, as soon as you say to someone that God has justified me and, and that's it, God will not lose me, they immediately say, oh, so you're saying that you can believe in Jesus, have faith in Christ, and then you can say, oh, God has justified me, and I can live any way I want for the rest of my life. I can go become an adulterer and a murderer, and it doesn't matter because God has justified me. Of course not. Of course not. You see, as soon as Christ justifies you, a process begins that we call sanctification. Sanctification coming from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. And so sanctification is a process in which God is making you holier. The Holy Spirit, when you come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes inside you, changes your heart, changes your nature, so now you love Christ, you hate your sin, and you live for Him from this moment on with the Holy Spirit sealed inside of you, as Ephesians chapter 1 says. So keep in mind that if a person is justified, he will be sanctified. These two go together. They're not the same thing. Justification and sanctification are not the same thing, but they are linked together. You can't have one without the other. If you're justified, you will be sanctified. And so you will spend the rest of your life of course, no one is perfect in this life. You will be perfected afterwards. But you spend this life doing good works. These good works do not save you. These good works do not justify you before God. God is not declaring you to be righteous because of these good works. He declared you to be righteous because of Christ's righteousness put on your account. The good works that you now do are a result of the fact that you have been justified and you have been regenerated by God. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, it's very, where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. Then verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works. The result of our salvation is doing good good works. Now, take a deep breath. Are you, are you with me so far? Have I confused you or you got this? Alright, nod if you got it. Okay, everyone's nodding. Alright, now. What we're going to do now is, I want to give you the Greek Orthodox slash Roman Catholic position concerning justification. Um, they're not identical. They're not identical, but the basic structure, structure is the same. There are some small variations, but not that important right here. All right, now, so, this is what we believe the Bible teaches. Now I'm going to show you what the Greek church and the Roman church teach. Birth. Death. We would agree with them that a man is born sinful and an enemy of God and needs to be reconciled to God. How does that happen though? Now, first of all, we disagree on the meaning of the word justification. We teach that justification is a declaration, a moment in time when God declares you to be just. They say, no, that's not what justification is. Justification, they say, is a process. Justification, they teach, is a process of making you righteous. Okay? Now you may say, that sounds a lot like sanctification. Yes, they basically say that justification and sanctification are pretty much the same thing. Sanctification being a process whereby you're becoming holier. Justification, they teach, is a process making you more righteous. Basically the same thing. So, how does this process of justification slash sanctification begin? 
It does not begin with faith. It begins with baptism. So, you baptize a person. Baptism. And then from this moment on, begins a process where the Holy Spirit is justify, is making you righteous and making you holy. So you got justification slash sanctification. Okay? And throughout your life, as you're being justified and sanctified, hopefully you will come to have faith. And you'll also hopefully come to have good works. This is all a process. Now, when is it that God, we have God here, the moment we have faith, declaring us as righteous and acceptable to Him? When will God do that according to the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholics? Well, that will happen after you die. Okay? After you die, based upon what you have done in your life, God will then declare you to be righteous or not righteous. Okay? Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, you can throw in a uh, purgatory here. If you're a Roman Catholic, you throw in 50, 100,000, a million years of purgatory. And then God will declare you just uh, guilty or not guilty. But either way, it's after death. So here, somewhere here, after death, there is a declaration by God. What we would have here, they would have at the end. After you die. But here's the important thing that I want you to understand. And this is the heart of the matter. We believe that God declares us righteous based upon Christ's righteousness given to us. They both believe that you are declared righteous based upon your own righteousness. Okay? The righteousness that you worked in your life is the one that God will use as a basis for if He will accept you or not. Okay? Vastly different. Vastly different. Now, a couple of problems. Now, <laughs> there are many biblical problems with this scheme. Many biblical problems. But let's just focus on justification for now. And let me give you a couple of reasons why this whole system just falls apart to begin with. A couple of reasons that justification, uh, the way that they view it, is false. First of all, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible is justification a process. Never. Nowhere will you find in the Bible justification being a process. It is a momentary thing, like we saw in Romans 5 where he says, having been justified... It's not a process that keep on going in a Christian's life. It happened. It's something that a Christian can look back on in their life. God justified me back then. It's not still going on. As a result of, what that, of then, I now have peace with God, as he said in Romans 5.1. Now that's one problem. And number two, the biggest problem is that the Bible teaches that justification is a declaration. It has nothing to do with changing you. Making you righteous. That's sanctification. Sanctification is the process of changing you and making you holy. Justification has nothing to do with changing your character. It is a legal declaration. Let me show you a couple of verses to prove this. I could show you numerous places, but let me just show you two. Please go to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 1. It says, if there is a dispute between men and they come to court, again note the legal aspect of it, they come to court, uh, that the judges may judge them, what are they to do? They are to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Notice the contrast between justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked. Now, does this mean that the judge is going to make a person righteous? 
course not. If he is righteous, he's righteous. If he is guilty, he is guilty. The, 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 judge, the judge's declaration has nothing to do with changing your character. It is a legal declaration. You are guilty or you are not guilty. That's what justifying means. It means to declare someone not guilty. And if you want a verse that's even clearer than that, you can go to the Gospel of Luke. One more verse. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 7. Luke 7 and verse 29. Jesus has been speaking concerning John the Baptist. And it says in verse 29, And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. Now here we read that the tax collectors justified God. Now do you think that that means that the tax collectors made God righteous? I doubt it. It means that they made a declaration. They saw what Christ said and they declared, God is righteous. It's a declaration. It's not a process of changing God and making Him righteous. To justify means to say, you're not guilty. That's what it means. So this concept right here of justification being a process by which a person is changed is false. Now, having said all these things, and, and we could look at a number of other problems with the Roman Catholic position, but, and the Greek position, but does all this really matter? That's the question. Does all this really matter? Because I can see people saying, Nico, look at all this. All these terms, justification and sanctification and declarations and baptisms, it's just so, uh, so theolo- can't we just, we, we all just love Jesus for crying out loud. Does this really matter? Or are we just making, uh, you know, arguments for nothing? That's the question. In the, in the 16th century, Martin Luther made this statement. He said, The doctrine of justification by faith alone, apart from works, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. In other words, he was saying, if a church does not believe in this doctrine, they're not a real church. They're not a real Christian church. Was he exaggerating? If you read some of the stuff that the reformers said, <laughs> they speak of the Roman church and they say it's not a Christian church. They called it the synagogue of Satan. You'd hear that today and you say, oh, you would never say that. Never call the Greek Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. Tell them, Wait, they love Jesus for crying out loud. So the question is, 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 is Luther right? I would say yes, he is. And I do not agree with Luther because he's Martin Luther. He is not my authority. But the Bible is my authority. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, says the same thing in the book of Galatians. And so let's turn to the book of Galatians and we'll close with this. Galatians. Chapter 1. There was a problem in the churches in Galatia. What was the problem? There were some people who were teaching that besides trusting in Christ, of course, which was important, there was one thing that you needed to do in order to be saved. And that was become a Jew. Same problem that we, lo- that we saw in uh, Acts 15. They said, in order for you to be justified before God, you need to get circumcised. And then you can be justified. Just this one thing. Just this one thing. You need to become a Jew first. They didn't say anything heretical about the Trinity. They didn't say Jesus is not God. They didn't say you don't need the grace of God. They didn't say anything about the humanity of Christ. They didn't say anything about sola scriptura. They, all these things they agreed. They agreed upon who Christ is. 
But they said there's one thing. You're not saved by faith alone. You're justified by faith and by this one work. Get circumcised. You need to get circumcised. Now, this is what Paul has to say. This is how he begins his letter. After a short introduction, the first five verses, listen to what he says in verse 6. I marvel, I'm amazed, that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. What you believe, what people are teaching you, is a different gospel. And then he, he kind of catches himself and corrects himself in verse 7. He says, which is not another. It's not, it's not really another gospel. It's not that we can have different... It's not that I have one gospel and you have another gospel and he has another gospel. There's only one gospel, so it's not really a gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And in case you didn't get it the first time, look at verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. The Greek word there is anathema. Of course, it's not a Greek word, it's an Aramaic word. Anathema basically means cursed by God. Literally, it means someone or something that has been set aside for destruction. That's what anathema means. This is strong language. Paul, how, how is it that the Apostle Paul, who in other places like Ephesians, stresses that Christians need to be united. Christians need to love one another. Christians need to have peace with one another. We need to bear with one another. He emphasized these things so much. How is it that all of a sudden, yeah, he starts like throwing out curses? What's wrong? The problem is that this is such an important issue that there can be no compromise to it. None. None. In chapter 2, where he keeps on... I mean, the entire book is about this problem in Galatia. In chapter 2, he even speaks of Peter, who started compromising on this. Started leaning towards the people who were saying, yeah, you need to become a Jew. That's the apostle Peter we're talking about. That's a scary thought. That an apostle of Jesus Christ could kind of think about compromising the gospel itself. And so Paul, in front of everyone, confronted him on it and rebuked him. Look at verse 15 in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. It's Paul speaking to Peter. And he says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. He's being sarcastic. We're not sinners like the Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Look how he ends in verse 21. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If you, look at the scheme here, if you can achieve righteousness by following the law of God, doing good works, then why did Christ come to die on the cross? If you can become righteous by following God's law, Christ died in vain. There was no point for him to die on the cross if you can achieve righteousness on your own. Paul says there is no compromise. You are saved by faith alone. You are justified by faith alone in Christ and not by works. 
The Galatians were adding one thing. One thing. The Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic add hundreds of things. Not just one. Hundreds. You need faith in Christ and hundreds of works in order to be saved. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. To say you need to do all these works in order to be justified, in order to be declared righteous before God, is to say that what Christ did was not enough to save me. What Christ did on the cross was not enough to justify me. I need to do a number of things, a number of works for God to declare me to be righteous. Christ's righteousness is not enough. And that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And what it does is it separates for eternity. It separates the glory of salvation to two parties. The glory for salvation doesn't just go to God for saving me. But it is separated amongst God and me. God did his part and I did my part. And I can boast for all eternity that there are people in hell right now because they didn't do the things that I did in order to be justified, in order to be declared righteous before God. And that's blasphemy. That's a false gospel. I'm not Greek Orthodox and I'm not Roman Catholic. The reason for that is I believe that they teach a false gospel. They do not teach in justification by faith alone. They teach in justification by faith and by works. And that's a false gospel. And a false gospel cannot save you. A false gospel leads you to a false Christ. So, what I have to say to us and anyone who may be listening is that if you think that you can stand before God in your own righteousness, you're not going to make it. You have never done enough to satisfy the law of God. Even the good works that we have done are tainted with sin. Nothing, we have never loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength and mind perfectly. Even the good works that we have done, have we done them for the right motives? Have we done them for complete love for God? Unless we have the perfect righteousness of Christ put on our account, we cannot stand before God. We will fail. And so I would plead to anyone who thinks that he can stand before God in his own righteousness to repent and turn to Christ for the righteousness that is given by him. And our sin is placed upon him. Like Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, I... I'm not going to stand before God in my own righteousness which is by the law but by the righteousness which is from God. And that is how you can be acceptable to God. Salvation is of the Lord. Let's pray.